Uh, when, I, when I was growing up, I didn't grow up as a Christadelphian. Uh, I grew up and my connection with Christianity was through the Methodist Church. Um, it was where we used to go. I was at the Cubs and the Scouts and we all used to go to the Methodist Church. Um, and so I ad adopted, as I was growing up, mainstream Christian teachings. Uh, I certainly believed uh, as a young man, a young boy, that, that you go to heaven when you die. And of course, we will know it's a, it's a prevalent truth in society today. Anybody that believes in Christianity, and frankly, a lot of people that don't also, uh, you, you'll hear it often said, it's, it's often on the news, isn't it, when somebody's died. You'll, you'll hear them say, or there's messages left on the flowers saying, you know, I know that they're looking down upon us, whoever it is that's died. And so there's, there's a message there that's existed throughout centuries of time where people believe that when you die, you go up to heaven. And what we'll look at, and it's, it's quite a simple address, this, because... The Bible's very clear about, about this as a teaching, um, that we don't go to heaven when we die. Uh, it, it's not contained within the scriptures. And it's interesting, you know, if you, if you go home after this talk, if you're so inclined, that you type in Google, do we go to heaven when we die, or what happens when we die, or anything, type it in and have a look. And Christian teaching on going to heaven. Uh, you'll see that what comes up is... Um, a number of different people, obviously, from different Christian sects, but they will, in the main, be directing your thinking to the 4th century, uh, the 3rd and 4th centuries AD, when you've got Saint Augustine and various other people writing about these subject matters. You won't find anybody quoting anything from the Bible. You might get a quote about the Apostle Paul when he makes a point, the man, the Apostle Paul, who preached the truth. He made a point when he was living. He said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And so people take that comment and they say, well, if dying is gain, then it must be because he's going to heaven. And so there's an extrapolation upon a point that the Apostle Paul is making, which, which is expressing how he feels about, um, about his life at that point in time. Um, and also as well, I, I deliberately had it read for us, but if we go to it, John chapter 14. You know, I've been to a lot of funerals. Uh, for different reasons over, over, over the years, with, with different connections. But I can pretty much guarantee that John 14 will feature very highly in the list of passages that will be read at a lot of funerals. And so they will, this is used um, by Christianity to say that, you know, Jesus has lovely words in John 14. And, and in terms of context, this is the night before Jesus is crucified. Uh, and he's talking to his disciples and, and there's a lovely sentiment that permeates this entire chapter concerning let not your heart be troubled over any matter that that's what Jesus is saying and then he, he says those words in verse 2 that are recorded for us in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also and so those words are taken and you'll note that it doesn't say that we go to heaven. It doesn't say that Jesus is going to come and get us and take us to heaven at the moment that somebody dies and that, and that, and that life departs. Um, but those are words that are taken in and used in that way. So we want to explore what the Bible says with regards to what happens if we don't go to heaven and what the whole point of it is um, a little bit like uh, we have at the end of the reading we had in verse 6 Jesus said to Thomas I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me and whilst that is actually a profound statement and quite a deep subject as far as the scriptures are concerned um, we will we will look at the the essence of that at the simplicity of it 
Uh, if we if we start by by asking a, a different question, then following those opening comments, what's the point of this life that we lead? I mean, we live in a very troubled world. We actually live in one of the best parts in the world in terms of privilege. The circumstances that the average person has in this country, they're very favourable compared to where we could be. Uh, but nevertheless, it doesn't matter where we are in the world, there's conflict, there's struggle, there's strife, there's unhappiness, there's violence. Um, it, it's, a, it's a profoundly troubled world. It's clearly a world that, that struggles for direction. I don't think there's a person on this planet that you could with confidence ask, a leader, a king, a queen, whoever it might be, and, and ask the question, you know, directionally, what's going on? Where are we going? There's no, there's no clarity of thought with regards to that. It's dealing with today's mess in the hope that tomorrow's won't be worse. Um, but God, and of course, we as Christadelphians, we believe that the Bible is a book that is inspired by God, who we believe is the creator of heaven and earth. And if there's a God and there's a creator, what's the point? What's the point of creating a world where there are the challenging circumstances that we see in this, at this point in time, and then once you've lived a life, you go up to heaven where everything's great? What, what's the sense of it? And the Bible provides a very different view with regards to that. And whilst that you'd have to spend a long time properly explaining all of the things I'm talking about, the, the actual theme of do we go to heaven or not does touch upon these, and, and hopefully we'll see that as we go through. So if you start by turning up um, Isaiah chapter 45, please. Isaiah 45 and verse 18. So God says, it's recorded for us here, Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he created it not in vain. So there's a statement of intent there. We, we're told a couple of things. One, God created the earth. Two, it wasn't um, a vain thing. In other words, it wasn't something without purpose there was intent what's the intent um he says i formed it to be inhabited so this earth was created so that it would be lived in and so we can look around the world in which we live and we can say well tick that box because it might not be a happy place it might be a troubled world but there's definitely life on it uh, it develops a little bit more than that when we come across to the prophet uh, habakkuk um, one of the smaller books towards the end of the Old Testament. And in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14, we're told that a world that's inhabited will carry certain characteristics. And the characteristics that this habitation will carry are as follows the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the lord as the waters cover the sea so this habitation that exists is knowledgeable of god and reflects his glory two fundamental carrying characteristics of this people that inhabit the earth now you wouldn't have to know your Bible to know that today's world doesn't reflect this. And this isn't the only place in the Bible it's reflected, but what it does do is talk about the long-term outcome. And, and God has an outcome for this world which is being outworked at the moment. The knowledge and the glory of the Lord on the earth. So in terms of scope, what we're told from the scriptures is that God is concerned and interested in the earth that he's doing something from his perspective that's constructive with it so not something ethereal not something in a different place or a different time but on the earth and so we want to explore then if there is to be this group of people that inhabit the earth that reflect 
a knowledge of God and a the glory of God, then how does that happen in practice with regards to the lives that we lead? This process of life that we're now living, um, all of us in this room. If we go back to um, the beginning, I'd like to turn back to Genesis and chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis 2 records for us an account of how God created man. Significantly at variance with the world's or society's teaching of uh, how man came to be. But this is the Bible's account and, uh, and it's an account that we as Christadelphians believe. In verse 7 we're told that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So we're told that God took the natural elements from the ground, described here as the dust, and he breathed into it what's called the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now what's important from the perspective of the way in which God chose to work with man with a focus on the ultimate type of habitation that God focuses on um, is the way in which he was brought to life. He was brought to life and became what scripture determines as a living soul. Now the Bible originally was written in Hebrew and in the Old Testament and Greek in the New <laughs> Testament and we ask ourselves the question, well, what's a living soul? We do note that it doesn't say an immortal soul. And we also are clear that the words immortal and soul never appear together. It's not a phrase that's known to the scriptures, immortal soul. So the living soul, the word soul, if you look up the word in terms of the meaning and its etymology, it means a living breathing creature that that's all it means it's something that exists and is alive and so the second part to that then which i guess i've already just covered a moment ago is well that living breathing creature as far as the bible's concerned does it have a point of termination is there a point where that can die is it possible for it to disappear or does it just continue um because there are those that, that might argue, well, a soul, can you really see it? It's not a tangible thing. I'd argue, actually, it is. It's the substance of what you see. It's the, the living, breathing creature um, of which we are, all are. Um, but scripture is emphatic that we're not built to last. This nature isn't built to last. The living, breathing creature spoken of in Genesis 2 is not built to last indefinitely. And equally importantly, the scripture does not differentiate when it comes to the nature, the substance of what we are, that living, breathing creature between uh, a man, a woman, or any kind of animal. We are all grouped together as the same when it comes to the substance that we're made of, creatures from the dust. So if we come across to Genesis chapter 7, This is talking about the end of the, the flood that happened at the time, as it's recorded for us in the Bible, at the time of Noah. And it tells us there in verse 21 that the, the outcome of that flood was that all flesh died that moved upon the earth in verse 21 of Genesis chapter 7. The birds, the cattle, all the beasts, everything that creeps on the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. And so we're being told there quite clearly that there's no distinction to be drawn here between anything of God's creation in which, as the Bible frames it, um, has the breath of life. It doesn't matter what you are, that, that, that's gone. Um, the scripture is very clear about talking regarding the nature of um, that we have as human beings uh, ecclesiastes is a good book for this if we come across to ecclesiastes chapter 9 the ecclesiastes ecclesiastes and psalms have a lot to say on this 
And the reason that those two books have a lot to say on this compared to other books in Scripture is because they are more reflective meditative books. Ecclesiastes is a book which, um, as far as Scripture goes, is really quite philosophical in the sense that it explores a number of different issues of living, of life, um, in, in, in a really quite profound and deep way. Similarly with the Psalms, the people who write the Psalms, they're reflecting the output of their meditations, the meditations of their hearts, the things that they're really thinking about. And so you get insight into the principles upon which God has created life through that. And so in Ecclesiastes 9, we're told here in verse 5, a truth. The living know that they shall die. Statement of fact, we know that we'll die. It's just that we're exploring, do we go to heaven after we've died? And it says that that's not the case because those of the dead know not anything, neither have any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more reportion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Verse 10 confirms the point again. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. So it says there that as you're living your life, whatever it is that you're engaged with doing, give it everything that you've got, it says. Give it everything you've got because once the period comes to an end, life comes to an end, there's nothing in the grave, it says. There's no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So it's saying there, you've got to value your time. And that's indeed, that's what it does go on to say in verse 12. It says that for all of us, man knoweth not, knoweth not his time. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net, as the birds that are caught in a trap, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, when it falleth suddenly upon them. And so the writer here in chapter 9 is trying to really convey to us the fact that we've really got to think hard with our lives. Life here is, is represented as an opportunity. There's a period of time that we've got and we should use our time to do whatever it is with our might because it will come to an end and then in the grave there's nothing. It, it's just dead. It, it's, it's silent. There's no existence. There's no life. I think the chapter's quite emphatic in, in drawing out that point. Um, if we... Have a look at Psalms for a moment in uh, Psalm 146. We get a reiteration here of what we just read in Ecclesiastes 9. In verse 4 of Psalm 146, um, well, in verse, we'll come from verse 3. Actually, let's go the whole way. Shall we read from verse 2? Um, we won't go as far as verse 1. Verse 2. While I live, will I praise the Lord. So the Bible would say that, that's, that that should be your point of focus. That's what it's encouraging someone to do. If you're alive, praise God. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. So that's the position of this writer. And then in verse 3 we're told, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. I think there's a significant proportion of people today, uh, whilst they might recognise or may not recognise certain values in Theresa May or whoever it is who wants to lead the country, I think most thinking people would say, well, I'm not going to put my trust in them. That's not where I'm going to rest my hopes. Um, and, and that's what this is expressing as a sentiment, that there's nothing that's going to come out of putting your trust in people. They can't do anything for you. There's no transformative impact that's going to come about from whatever it is the people in positions of power and authority are able to actually deliver. So in verse 4 it then says, for the prince in verse 3, whoever it is that's in a position of authority, whoever it is that is the person of the moment, verse 4, their breath goeth forth, but they return to the earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. And the reason for coming to this verse as well is just to draw out and re-emphasise, because the word was also in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 
it's the word perish and that that is a permanent extinction it's not talking about something that can be brought back to life something that is perished has gone forever and so it, it's drawing out very clearly to us that even if you're the brightest shining light of the age in which you live there's nothing that can be done for you to circumvent the process of the way we are made and, and, and the, the substance of our nature. We, we all die. But there is a difference um, between um, those that die that don't believe the things of the Bible and those that do. The, the Bible's very clear to draw it out. And so we ask ourselves a question, well, if we don't go to heaven, and we just confirm that, if we come across to the Gospel of John in chapter 2, uh, if, if we don't go to heaven, then, then what is it? If God's creating this habitation that will reflect his glory and a knowledge of him and fill the earth, which is what we read, how is he going to achieve that? Um, well, in the Gospel of John and verse and chapter 2, I can always remember, it's never left me, when I came into contact with them, um, with the truth. The first book that I was given was called, it's a book called Christendom Astray, um, written by a man called Robert Roberts. Uh, and whilst the English is perhaps a little bit an antiquated, um, the, the, the modes of expression that are used aren't current, I do remember reading it. And I, I really can, with a moment of clarity, when I read the chapter on about not going to heaven and opening the Bible, which churches aren't very adept at, uh, and just simply reading passages uh, and f and the penny dropping that well whatever i do believe if it's based on the bible then it can't be that we go to heaven and this is one of the important verses i always remember the first time i read it john uh, john chapter three uh, now the Gospel of John is written from a perspective that John's writing after the events, and of course he is, he wasn't there writing an eyewitness account at the moment that things happened. But he actually expresses it in that way as well, whereby he talks about the things that have happened whilst he was with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a man writing after the event and, and, and sometimes reflects on the fact that that's exactly what it is. He's reflecting on what he observed and provides his own insights on occasions. Anyway, here he's writing following the Lord Jesus Christ's uh, um, death by crucifixion. And he says in verse 13 of chapter 3, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So I remember reading it for the first time and thinking to myself, well, if, you know, firstly, what happened to all the people before Jesus lived if in terms of going to heaven um, and could anything have happened subsequent to him going but the scripture is very emphatic because it's writing about when Jesus is already in heaven um, it says no man has gone up to heaven in verse 13 only Jesus Christ which as it says in the present tense when John was writing it Jesus is in heaven but nobody else is now, I really remember that sinking deep into me being staggered that a belief that countless millions of people have that you go to heaven when you die is in black and white where it's not it's not evasive and it's not open to interpretation no man has gone up to heaven so of course the belief through the life of jesus is that he died through crucifixion and that he rose again to newness of life on the third day he was resurrected from the dead and the resurrection is a fundamental cornerstone belief uh, for Christadelphians um, in terms of the process that Jesus went through that foreshadows the process that all those who have a part to play in God's plan and purpose will also go through themselves um, in terms of God achieving what he set out to do, which is a habitation that reflects a knowledge of him and his glory. So if you come across to 1 Corinthians 15,
1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we have the Apostle Paul here. Um, <coughs> he presents for us a logical argument. It, it, it's, a, it's a sequential thought process. It's almost as if he's thinking it through as he's writing it, not, in, not for his own benefit, but, but for the Ecclesia at Corinth. Uh, as he goes through consequentially that if you say this, then this will be the case. Uh, and so it leads us to an understanding of, of what it means with regards to believing whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead or not. So in verse... Um, let's have a look. Verse 12. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So that's the question, and that's, that's the point of tension when we're considering this subject in terms of how is God going to achieve what we read he's going to achieve with this earth. And so Paul, and you follow it through, and it's not, it's not especially complicated. In verse 13, he says, if there isn't a resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And that stands to reason. Uh, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. So he starts off by saying, if that as an event didn't take place, this is all a waste of time. This is pointless. He says in verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, so we'd be liars if this was the case, because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, in verse 16, then is Christ not raised. And in verse 17, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. And so, crucially, he then says, if none of this happened then there is only one outcome. And the outcome isn't that someone went to, goes to heaven. The scriptural terms that are used for people when they die is one of two words. They either perish or they sleep. And the people who believe in the things of God are described in the scriptures as going to sleep. And when Christ returns, which is what the Bible talks about, they wake up from that sleep. But if they aren't associated with these things, then God in his mercy, because he's not a vengeful God in wanting some kind of everlasting punishment, it's just that a life of ignorance of God, it results in an outcome, and that outcome is eternal sleep, it, it, eternal rest, if you like. You perished, you're, you're gone forever. The outcome of all of this, the Apostle Paul says, that in verse um, 18 then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And there's that transfer of state from if this isn't true, then somebody who we'd said was asleep isn't, they're perished. And, and there's those two classes of people. Um, if we come across, just to, just to test this, um, if we come to 2 Samuel 7, please. And what we'll do is we'll just look at a couple of quotes from Old and New Testament and reflect on, on an example. And the example here is the life of David. Because we can see um, through Scripture exactly what happened to David. So in 2 Samuel 7 and verse 12, we read there, When thy days be fulfilled, so when your life comes to an end, thou shalt sleep with thy father. So we get that term, and David's told that he's going to go to sleep. And God says that, that there's going to be development from David concerning his purpose, which is that habitation, which we've spoken about. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. I will establish his kingdom. Verse 14, I will be his father. He shall be my son. And verse 16, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So here we have, through David something that is going to result in a state of permanence. It's going to exist forever. There's going to be a kingdom that comes from him. But David's told very clearly, this is going to happen after your life has come to an end. So David will be asleep. Um, if you come across to Acts chapter 2, when the apostles were preaching God's purpose, the good news of what's called the kingdom of God, a phrase which most people in Christendom are at least familiar with, uh, they spoke about David. Acts 
Acts chapter 2 and verse um, verse 29 Men and brethren let me speak let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he's both dead and buried so that confirms what we read in 2 Samuel 7 and his sepulchre his grave is with us unto this day Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. So we have here... And for David, and it's reflected in his Psalms, a hope of the resurrection. David is dead and buried, it says, but he had a hope of the resurrection. And we're told very clearly in verse 34, and this is a long time after David had died. Um, we're told, the verse 34, David is not ascended into the heavens. And so, it, similar to John chapter 2, it's just making the point that you know, David is not in heaven. David is dead and buried, still in the grave where he was buried. But the resurrection is the point, the, the event at which um, the whole purpose of God rests. The question as to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, a man, a historical figure who definitely lived, um, the Bible says, he's unique in that he was raised from the dead as 1 Corinthians 15 articulates it he was the first fruits of those that slept so of those people that fall asleep he um, he is the first one to go through the process of being raised from the dead and and that's the hope for all of those for all of us who believe in the things of the scriptures if you come to Isaiah chapter 26, it talks to us about the two different classes of people, those that perish and those that sleep. Now this is a bit similar to Psalm 146 that we looked at. It's talking about people who are put in places of authority, positions of authority, what happens to them. We're told in Isaiah 26, it says, uh, in verse 12, Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, thou also hast wrought all our works in us. O Lord our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us. And in the context of modern day, it can be whoever. It can be a David Cameron, a Theresa May, whoever it might be. But they have the position of authority where the decisions they take, they have an impact on society. I'd argue they're not transformative as I've already said but but they have that position of authority that's the type of person that's been spoken of here although dominion in the cultural and historic sense of when we're reading uh, conferred a greater degree of power than politicians have today but uh, that's beside the point in verse 13 it, as we've just read it says other lords beside thee have had dominion over us but by thee only will we make mention of thy name and all these people that have ruled over them, and we've seen it in our lifetime of people who might have been in positions of authority when we were little and as we've grown up and lived our lives. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. And so it's very, very emphatic. They're dead. They won't live. They're deceased. They shall not rise. The rising there with reference to resurrection coming out of the grave. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. And so emphatically it says they no longer exist. But people that have to do with God, if we turn over the page, um, when we come to God's people, we're told in verse 19, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. See, we, we get the, the clear distinction between the two classes of people. The one class which we hope to be part of, and it's how God is going to realise that global habitation of beings that reflect a knowledge of him and a glory of him, they will be resurrected from the dead. And so how does that happen? 
is that staggered what, what is it like jesus after three days um because we don't see many people being raised from the dead do we three days after they have died and so scripture makes it clear for us when that will be and, and it's drawn out for us in acts chapter 17. and this is our um, this is our final uh, verse So in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is preaching to a group of people that consider themselves to be really quite intellectual, really quite smart. And what he's trying to do is make it clear to them the simplicity of what it is that God's put in place and, and how it hinges on the resurrection. Now he starts off... Um, in verse 23 and Paul says I passed by and beheld your devotions I found an altar to this inscription to the unknown God and so if you're dealing with somebody that's smart they want what they want to do is um, they want to manage um, they want to constrain unintended consequences they want to make sure that they've covered all bases and so at this time they had a number of gods but just in case there was a God for some aspect of life or they'd got something wrong, they had an unknown God. And Paul says, I want to talk to you about the God that is not known to you. And so he talks in verse 24 that this is a God with tremendous power. It's a God, um, he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling not in temples made with hands. Verse 25, he's not worshipped with men, men's hands. He gives all life and breath and all things, which is what we read in Genesis 2. Verse 26, we're told that he has constructed this earth with the boundaries in place that's created in different names and different peoples, but broadly, the, the, na the nation states that exist on the earth, the political landscape globally, the different languages and cultures that exist in all the countries god's the author of that it says in verse 26 um, and he's determined across the history of man exactly when certain things are going to happen so there's a lot that paul is saying here to draw out to them that the god of the bible is truly an all-powerful god he's one who's in control of a specific purpose that he wants to achieve which we very briefly looked at this afternoon now there is some responsibility conferred on individuals. Paul says in verse 27, he said, all of this has been done so that people should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And so we get an interesting dynamic here in the scriptures with regards to the fact that God does call people, but people themselves, there has to be something in them where they're searching out for things, thinking people. Um, and then he goes on to say that in verse 31, God's calling out all of these people. There's people responding to his word, the Bible. There are others that don't. There are some that decide to dedicate their lives to it. And there are others that to choose to say, what a load of rubbish. I'm going off to do whatever it is I want to do. But in verse 31, it says there comes a point uh, that God has appointed a day, a specific singular day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And so there's a specific day, and chapters like 1 Thessalonians 4 talk about this in more detail with regards to the fact that there is a process where all those asleep in Jesus Christ will be raised from the dead. Now, the point for us, I think, is in verse 32, because just as you've listened to a talk this afternoon, there were those that listened to the Apostle Paul talking. And amongst that group, they all had different responses, different thoughts, uh, and, and a different intent that they were going to take away from it. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. The blessing of God for all of us, irrespective of the type of world we live in and the fact that we can't really control the circumstances of our life, is that he's given us all free will. It's up to us. 
we can determine whether we want to think about things and we want to pursue things we can determine whether we want to set something at naught and move on that's our decision but the message of the bible very strongly is that god does have a purpose he is developing a creation of men and women that will reflect his glory and have an intimate and complete knowledge of him and the process through which he's doing this hinges on the resurrection of the lord jesus christ being the first to go through a process that all those who believe on the things of god will likewise at some point go through and it's certainly the speaker's earnest desire that for those of you that aren't baptized and for those of you that are unfamiliar with these things that in this world in which we live you might take the wise decision of spending some time to reflect on the important matters of life